You're at The Coaching Inn, 3D Coaching's virtual pub where we enjoy conversations with people who are engaged in the world of coaching. Hello there. Thanks for joining us today um, as we host a essentially a mini series um, within 3D's podcast, The Coaching Inn, while Claire is on <clears throat> sabbatical, walking the Camino. Um, for, those that you, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kirsty Elderton, and I'm going to be your host for today. Um, and I've been coaching with 3D and individuals and coaching in organizations for over 10 years. And I also lead a design practice for Naus Group, which is a consulting firm. And that gives me the great privilege of working with individuals, but also taking a bit of a peek behind the curtains of organizations through my consulting work. And one of my favorite things amongst all of that is to see leaders who might not think of themselves as coaches applying coaching skills in their practice. And in this series, we're taking a deep dive into a very specific leadership trait or characteristic and exploring that with a leader who embodies that trait, someone who is, um, to use that lovely Brene Brown expression, in the arena, demonstrating that quality day in and day out. Um, my very strong hunch is that there's going to be a lot we can learn from people who are living those qualities, either as leaders ourselves, as coaches, or just as people who want to have a more positive impact in the world. So I'm really excited to introduce our next guest to the arena. Um, I've had the great pleasure of working with him over the last couple of years. And as well as learning loads from him, it's also just been a lot of fun. And so today um, I'm really pleased to welcome Kamal Ibrahim to the podcast. And we are going to be talking all things coaching and that much needed leadership quality of adaptability. So Kamal, welcome. Um, perhaps say hello, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your background. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for having me, Kirsty. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Kamal Ibrahim. Um, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I've arrived um, from Ethiopia uh, in 2003 with my uh, two sisters and four brothers. Um, and, um, you know, since I've arrived in Australia, my whole journey has been absolutely um uh, amazing um it's been up up and down but uh, a lot of um a lot of uh i would say uh, things that i didn't know um about australia when i arrived first here has has been a, a big challenge and you know to mm. to to where I am from first, from Ethiopia when I arrived here 2003 to now, it's been a it's a been it's been a big challenge. Hopefully, we can talk in depth about it a little bit. But yeah, I'm like Kirsty said, uh, I'm a, a founder of Wambo, which is a non-for-profit organization, and we focus on um, helping disadvantaged kids to be fit and healthy uh, using soccer as 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 a vehicle. Yeah, thank you, Kamal. I'm sure we'll touch a little bit more on that story as we delve into this idea of adaptability. But um, just tell us a little bit, Kamal, about how you managed to turn your kind of passion for soccer into way of into a way of kind of, I guess, communicating, connecting, settling into a new place that that um, yeah that very young age of 12 yeah sure well my passion from soccer for soccer started really when I was back at home my older brother mm. was a soccer player we grew up in a small village in Ethiopia called the Gajafe and uh, I used to wake up in the morning uh, go with him to to soccer training 6 a.m holding his bags and soccer balls you know mm -hmm. and yeah I just fall in love with the game and uh and you know it's funny how now after all these years how you know for me soccer 
in a way saved my life, you know, the passion I had for soccer. Um, because when, when, when the war did happen between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and when we got separated from my family, from my two oldest brothers, my dad, uh, long story short, but they, they've been, you know, forcibly taken from, you know, from our house and uh, pretty much tracked in the border to go back to Eritrea. Um, that's when, you know, then, you know, to avoid, I, I feel like to avoid, you know, missing my dad and my brothers, I used soccer again that time to kind of just uh, give me happiness. So I played a lot of soccer when I was younger. And then from, from that small village, then I had to again move to a, a bigger city to start the process to come to Australia. And then, um, you know, my mother just being by herself, it was obviously difficult. Um, and I could see that. And, and, you know, most of the time, again, I spent uh, my whole day outside playing soccer uh, with friends and, and going for a, a long, long uh, walk to, to play into tournaments. And, you know, when I first come to Australia, then, you know, it, it, was, it was very difficult to settle in, you know, for many reasons. So, so I use soccer again to, to kind of fit in or make friends um, or uh, feel like, uh, you know, I belong here. So, you know, it, it, soccer has been definitely a big part of um, who I am today. And Kamal, I know you've been a little bit humble here because you would have started, I guess, at a local club, progressed through the leagues, went on to play professional soccer, under 21s for the Socceroos, the Australian men's team. So um, it it wasn't just a passion. Hey, it was it was a career for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it started with a passion. You know, I've never had the the vision to play soccer professionally or know how much players get paid or anything like that I just did it like I said back at home we didn't have tv we didn't have anything and that was the way for us to spend the the day you know um and when I first came here uh, you know there was a lot of um uh, negativity towards me um, and I didn't know what it was from the start you know I would I would, uh, you know, jump on the bus and people look at me weird or I would be at school and people start saying, you know, things that I did. I knew that, you know, it wasn't nice things because they, just their body language uh, mm. meant to me that I didn't belong here. So it took me a while to to kind of know why people were very rude towards me. And that's when I, like you said, I went to a local club and I started playing. And then from there, all of a sudden, you know, the coaches um, and the players accepted me as a family. And um, and then from there, everything took off very fast. Uh, you know, I got uh, called up to play for, for Victoria um, and then started traveling into States and then got called up to play for Australia and travel the world. Um, and yeah, it just gave me this belief, uh, to, to do more with my life. Um, and, and obviously, uh, played professionally for Melbourne Heart, now Melbourne City. Uh, so it's given me, yeah, it's given me so many good things, but it, it did have a lot of sacrifice and a lot of, um, uh, hurdles that I had to overcome to try to get to where I wanted to get to. And you've more recently, Kamal, combined that kind of love of soccer, I think, with some of those experiences you were just describing, being a young person, um, new to Australia in the in your not-for-profit one ball. Um, and I know, I know how passionate you are about one ball and the work that you're doing. So just paint a picture of one ball for us and what's involved and the work that you're doing with young people today. Yeah. So one ball, you know, first of all, the, the name come from where, where, you know, when I had one soccer ball and how much it meant to me. Um, and that's all it meant to us when we were kids back at home, 
just one soccer ball could do uh, a lot for us and it gave us so much joy and it, gave, it distracted us from all these things. So, you know, when when I kind of stopped, stopped playing professional, um, I realized, you know, so many kids in Australia that uh, love soccer, but they can't afford to play in the club because the clubs obviously cost so much money. Um, they can't afford uniform or they get told you're not good enough. Um, you have to do trials and stuff like that. And and I, I said to myself, oh my God, what about if there was a kid who would like me and he was trying to fit in, um, but he didn't find the club that I did. And, um, and you know, they, they, he just want to, to play football and it's not, a big, it's not about being professional, but that kind of belonging to to uh, um, a club or organization, feeling like, you know, they have a teammate and support. So that's when I said, okay, I, will, I would love to create something like that where, where parents and kids from different cultures can come together uh, without worrying about uh, paying a, a big registration fee, um, being told um, you're not good enough or being told, um, you know, you don't belong in this club because you're different from a different culture. So I started first to just to bring everyone together and give this kid the sense of feeling that I had being a part of a, a, a team. And then obviously over the years that they've come into, you know, different things. Um, as, as you know, now we, we've included in our soccer session, positive affirmation for the young kids and character strength uh, for the older kids. So that's all, all the things I learned from soccer. You know, like I said, you know, there's so many times that I wasn't, I wasn't um, welcome to play for, to play soccer in my teammates. They were jealous, uh, you know, they call me names or the crowd will say something or the coach tell me I'm not good enough or I'll go through injuries. There was a lot of things in soccer that it wasn't all just good things um, that I had to come uh, um, to, 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 to be strong and, and, and to mm. continue my dream. So, you know, we want to um, start, you know, because these kids don't play soccer every, every single day or in a club environment. We want to kind of teach them that, you know, they have different qualities, you know, rather than just a soccer player. Um, and this is why we including, you know, character strength building with the kids. Um, and yeah, it has just been a great journey and we have some, we have a lot of big dreams for one ball. I want to do a lot of things. So, but so far it's been a great start. Just, I just want to say like a massive congratulations on the extraordinary success of one ball to have over. Yeah. I think is it something like 250 children and young people in the program now is huge. And I know you've got massive plans to kind of take it even further, but I just, you've painted a bit of a picture Kamal of some of the challenges, some of the barriers, some of the hurdles you've had to overcome. Can you just talk yeah. to us about this idea of adaptability and, and how it's perhaps served you well over those years? Um, yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's for me, uh, in my whole life, I had to adapt in, in, in some kind of way, you know, um, and you only get through, um, through you know, adapting if, 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 if through your environment, you know, if things change and other things come, then you have to adapt to them. You have no choice, you know, for, for example, you know, when I was back at home, like I said, when I was a young kid, you know, our whole life has been um destroyed by by the government and took in my my dad's business and took in him and my brother just overnight just like that and and just removed everything and i was only five years old i think at that time and you know i remember being so scared and my mom and my brothers you know just my other younger older brothers trying to trying to get us out of the village we were in because everybody knew that we were Eritrean, you know? Yeah. Um, and we had to we had to flee to a different city and hide. Um, so when I went to Addis Ababa, which is the capital city, I had to adapt there um, to, uh, 
even though it's in the same country, but it's a bigger city, you know, we're from a small village and I had to adapt uh, going to school there, make sure nobody found out that I was Eritrean, you know, um, and, and then when I come to Australia, then that was, that was obviously a big challenge and it wasn't easy to, to adapt to the culture differences, to, to English, um, to, to the people, um, and uh, to the food, um, you know, it took me a, a good uh, couple of years to kind of, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm still adapting to it. Um, but I would say, you know, I, I've done a great job uh, adapting and, and, and understanding not only the culture, but understanding uh, other people's uh, way of view, um, because obviously they, they were born here and. And for example, my coaches, you know, my coaches, I feel like uh, the coaches didn't adapt to me, but I, mm. I adapted to them. Every single coach I had because it's easier for them. It was easier for me to adapt to the culture rather than them adapting to my culture because I feel like they had no idea about my culture. Absolutely nothing. And, you know, some sometimes that kind of cost me. Um, uh, a lot of uh, misun misunderstanding uh, yeah. because they didn't know my culture or they refused to adapt they refused to understand me um, they kind of uh, mistreated me in, in a lot of in a lot of wrong ways um, so adapting uh, I feel like especially for for coaches it's it's very it's a big thing you know not everybody is the same and you need to you need to kind of have an open mind and understand um, each, everyone's uh, personality and everybody's uh, needs. So, you know, for me now as a coach uh, and I'm passionate, that's something that uh, I look forward to. And I always know that I can't treat everybody the same. And I try to um, adapt in different situations, different location. Um, I, there's obviously as Wambo, you know, we do a different location. And, um, you know, I have to adapt myself uh, if we're doing a program in, 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 uh, in Crumbin, for example, which is a different city, a different background. A lot of families from there, from Afghanistan. So uh, I've tried to um, make it work uh, for them and not treat them exactly the same as the Paul Melbourne for program, for example. Kamal, what I think is really interesting about what, what you're saying there is that um you know those earlier early experiences of perhaps not being understood by the folks that coached you um have really informed your coaching practice and it sounds like you put in a lot of effort to kind of educate yourself about the people that you're working with and you know not make too many assumptions or at least challenge some of the assumptions that might be kind of planted in our brains even if we didn't intentionally kind of put them there um about those different communities and cultures that you work with and I I'm just sort of reflecting that that's an important lesson for all of us isn't it that kind of opportunity to think reflect educate ourselves about the folks that we're interacting with so we're not um we're not missing in conversations we're not missing each other inadvertently and at worst, it Absolutely. could be disrespecting. And at, at best, it might be, you know, just misunderstanding. Yeah, absolutely. I think everything is about misunderstanding, not knowing when to know other people's culture or, or put yourself in their shoes. A lot of coaches, when I was first come to Australia, or even now, they, they don't have any idea about my culture. Um, so anything that I do, it's been seen as... For example, you know, they used to say a lot of things to me when, oh, Kamal has um, an attitude problem, you know, mm. and uh, he has this, he has that. And be, that, that's easy for them to say that rather than um, understand where I'm coming from or understand why I am doing the things that I'm doing. Uh, because as I mentioned to you, I was in Australia two, three years um, and they expected me to live the Australian style or they expected me to do the things they were doing. But, you know, I've lived before then in a different culture, in a different 
uh, mentality. So it's going to take me years to adapt to this culture, right? So mm. they don't understand that, oh, everything then should become automatically and you should be doing everything that uh, the kids were born in Australia. Um, but that, 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 that is no reality, you know? Um, so, yeah, I just feel like, you know, they don't, you know, they don't, they didn't care about uh, knowing and understanding. It was easy for them to blame me because, again, I'm just one one person, one kid. Um, so they can just get other other players who then understand the culture and understand um, the way of life. Um, so, yeah, in, like you said, now it, it for me, absolutely, I try to, um, you know, make sure that I'm not missing out um, trying to understand other people and where they're coming from and, and be patient and not uh, assume that or they're being rude or they have attitude or they have this, you know. Mm. That, um, that, that example you give about attitude is an interesting one, isn't it? Because in um, I'm just reflecting that I, I work with someone who has has been accused of that kind of attitude type face, facial expression. And actually yeah. it's um, often because they're very shy and in their culture, um, they're very, what's the word? Mm, very respectful of people in senior positions. And so the tendency is to be quiet, to be shyer, but it, but for somehow, somehow it's read as something differently. And so one of the sort of golden rules we talk about in coaching is if you're not really, if it's not clear what's happening with someone is to just, is to ask them, I notice you're, you're being quiet. What's that about? Um, rather than kind of diagnose or jump to conclusions too early. But I'm just sort of thinking that out loud, Kamal, and wondering what that would have been like to have someone ask those sorts of questions. Ask, uh, sorry, say that again. Ask um, like if one of your if the if one of your coaches instead of jumping to the conclusion about oh Kamal's got attitude if they'd have asked you a question around we notice you're not participating Kamal or whatever the right question might have been yeah. would that have felt welcoming yeah, or would it have felt exposing oh. I'm not sure yeah 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 absolutely you know I I felt like I was being attacked mm. the whole time and I was I wasn't you know I had to prove myself I, I will give you an example. Um, you know, in my culture, if you um, come one hour late, okay, you are very early, right? Yeah. Uh, in Australia, if you come five minutes late, uh, then you are not professional and you are not disciplined and you are, uh, you have attitude, right? So I used to, I went to training uh, five minutes late. I've got treated like, I've killed someone, right? And mm. and and I was I was rude. I wasn't disciplined. I wasn't professional. I was I was this everything that you can name of. But mm. the reality is, you know, I come here. My mother doesn't drive. My brothers they don't care about soccer or taking me to training. They have their own. Mm -hmm. They're trying to live in Australia, trying to earn money. Um, so there was no one. I had no backing. I had to do everything for myself at 12 years old, 13, 14, 15. So I had to catch a bus two hours to get to training or two and a half, maybe traffic. So five minutes late, you know, for me, it was like I was trying to do my best, right? Mm. So but for the coaches, it was like, oh, my God, this kid is coming five minutes late. He, has, he doesn't like soccer. He doesn't be professional. But the thing is, I was the most... I played soccer my whole life. I have more passion than than anybody there, and I did it for for because you know I loved it, and it wasn't because I wasn't professional, but it just shows you that you know people rather give you and tell you things that um, you are not um, good at rather than try to find out you know how they can help you or what your situation is and you know so small things like that you know that's just one example yeah. but you know now when I'm coaching and I, I see kids come late and I see other kids who come early um, and and they come with their parents you know the parents actually there they watch them you know 
they give them uh, support. And I see a kid coming off the bus, right? And he's like five minutes, 10 minutes late. You know, I have to be more understanding of his situation, you know? Yeah. You're just reminding me again, which is a great reminder, isn't it? Because we can we can think we're doing well at this, at this kind of awareness and acknowledgement of different people's circumstances. But it's so easy to slip into um, our own standards and expectations and not give that patience and care that and concern that I think you're describing, Kamal. Yeah. I think I think so too. I think yeah, uh, it, it just takes a you know a small amount of patience to to really to understand the person. You know, mm. it's not. I'm not saying that you know the coaches should should definitely let me come late every single training session. You know, I'm not yep. saying that, but I, I, it's about understanding and seeing uh, without uh, blaming the person. Trying to try to understand. Mm where they're coming from and see if they if if you can ad- adapt to to their culture or their way of yeah. of life because who said that coming five minutes late is, is 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 not good who said coming one hour late proves to you that you're professional or you're gonna win game you know it, it's not proven you know so a different culture for example in Brazil I had Brazilian teammate in Brazil they said training is 9 30. As long as you're on the pitch by 9.30, that's okay, right? And Brazilians are the most skillful players out there. And when he was talking to me, because he had the same issue, he said, training is at 9.30. They want us here to be 10.30. He goes, I have family. I have things. I'd rather spend those times with my family. Why do I have to become here an hour early? It doesn't mm. make sense. Is it proven that it's going to win your championship? Is it proven that you're not going to get injured? It's, it's got nothing. It's just the way because of the Australian way of life, that everybody does that, so everyone should do it. But it's got no scientifically proof that coming one hour late is good for you. Or come, coming five min- just five minutes before training, uh, it, it's, it's just as, 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 as okay for me, you know, unless you need treatments and everything like that. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, weird one, to be honest. So there's a, I think there's a challenge here, isn't there, about not, um, yeah, not overplaying your own experience and expectations and kind of finding that meeting place in the middle. Because I think what I'm hearing, Kamal, is that you did all of the adapting and the dominant kind of culture didn't do very much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you, 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 you can... It's it's a it's a big difference from from obviously Africa to Australia, yeah. uh, the way everything everything is done, right? I'm not coming from England to Australia or from Europe. It wasn't it wasn't the case. So yeah, I had to do a lot of adapting, uh, where my coaches didn't have to do as much, and you know I I was always blamed and and yeah. this that and and I you know I fought through it and I try to do as best as that I can. Um, yeah, and I'm just giving back now to to um, through one ball to to the younger kids and kids from you know obviously from African background as well. You know, some of them already playing professional that that I mentor and and coach and try to you know uh, give them my experience and what's needed from them uh, because I, I would like to hate to see uh, kids not being selected because he's been misunderstood by the coaches, you know? Mm. And I think one of the things I was just sort of reflecting on when I was listening to you, Kamal, is that, um, you know, the the coaching that you do with those young people, um, of course, it's technical coaching around soccer, but it's also those um, sort of supportive conversations that help them with their sort of health and well-being um that you know people who working um I was going to say life coaching that's maybe not the right maybe not the right term but people who are professional coaches working in the workplace for example um yeah it sounds like 
you're sort of sowing the seeds of some of this learning with those young people through those more transformational conversations that you're happen that you're having with them through soccer. Um, how important do you think this idea of adaptability is for the young people that you're working with? It's it sort of had some challenges for you, but it also seems to have served you well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, anything in life is um, is is a learning lesson. You know, if mm. if I didn't go through that, I obviously I wouldn't be the person I am today. And uh, for me, um, you know, I I I, I try to adapt um, to to everything that I can. Uh, but most of the kids that we're working with at the moment. They're either born here or they come to Australia when they're very young. So they are aware of, uh, they are more adapted than when I was, when I first came here. Mm. So it's more like uh, now for them is, um, you know, okay, you know, you, you, you need to understand that you, you, you know, you're, you're a human being um, and, and you know you have this whole life in front of you, and you know you're gonna be challenged um, in so many ways. And I feel like sport is the perfect uh, place to challenge yourself. You know uh, because you know you 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 in a team environment. You have to learn how to work with the team. You have to learn how to lose, then get up again. You have to get injured go all the way down and then build yourself up again, come back again, and then get injured again and build yourself up again. And then you, 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 you know, the coaches maybe not happy with you or, or another player come take your sport or you sit down on the bench, then you have to deal with that. Um, you know, there's so many things sports, uh, soccer taught me uh, to prepare me for, for the real life. Right. And, and, and the study shows that, and and uh, and I've talked to so many uh, athletes that, you know, if they didn't have soccer, and kids who don't have soccer, and my friends who don't have a sport team, for example, they can't cope with a pressure in life than a person who played sports. And for me, it, it's amazing because, and I know why, because when you not involved in a sporting team, you, you're not challenged, you know, you're just going to work or you at school, everything is easy. Um, and, you know, you do what you can do. But when you play sport, like I, I mentioned before, you're challenged in, in a different way. So you're building this resilient, you're building courage, you're building teamwork, you're building leadership, you're building all these great uh, character strengths that you're going to need when you grow up. Um, so this is why, I, I mostly I wanted to put those kids in in the sport environment in 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 a team environment where they where they challenge and then try to teach them about their their own character strength um, and the people who are listening to this podcast you know if we ask you know how many of you right now understand exactly what your powers are as a human being and exactly know okay you can point out this is my strength and I'm actually using them, um, it, it won't be money, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that was the case for me. And someone asked me, oh, come on, what's your strength? And I used to say, oh, I'm a good soccer player. I'm this, I'm that, because that's all I knew. That's all the coaches said to me. If I played good, oh, Kamal was amazing today. He's a great soccer player. If I played bad, oh, he was terrible today. He, he wasn't as so good. So when I, when I understand that, you know, we have all these amazing qualities as a person, as a character, uh, which is called character strength, our personality strength. Then I said, oh, my God, you know, I really want to know what minds are so I can understand in depth and, and see what I'm, the way I'm living my life or the way the things I'm doing right now is in line with that. If not, then I understand why I'm suffering or why my business not working because I'm trying to, I'm not using my strength, you know? So mm. this is why it's so important for the kids to say, okay, you, you know, you we're using soccer as a vehicle, but then we want to kind of, you know, just 
get them thinking about this this other aspect of of their life which will help them when they grow you know and i think that's more important than just being a soccer player so this is why um uh yeah wambo is is becoming not just a, a soccer uh field or they can come and kick the ball and and go but um just try to try to uh empower them um outside of their soccer life as well so i'm sensing kamal that um all of the changes and new circumstances you've experienced from you know moving in your home country moving to australia moving clubs moving to professional sport moving into a sort of ceo type role of one ball the all of that kind of changing and flexing into those new roles if you like or new circumstances have really given you a sort of yeah I was just thinking that all the changes um that you've experienced you know moving from moving within your own in your home country then moving to Australia community sport professional sport and now leading an organization all of those changes and fitting into new circumstances have um I get the sense that they've that all of that change has created a a more positive or at least a, a stronger mindset, a stronger sense of purpose. Um, yeah. Is that yeah, fair? definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can only be challenged if, if life puts something in front of you, you know, and yeah. you know, if I, if I was, if I was just in Ethiopia in one place, nothing happened. And uh, then I won't be going through um uh, all these processes or all this adaptation that I've gone through, right? So God has a funny way of, of testing you. And, you know, even though the war, the war um, that happened in Ethiopia and my, being separated from my, my dad was a, a terrible mm-hmm. thing. But then, uh, you know, it got me the opportunity to come to Australia and to do things that I would never had uh, thought I'll be capable of, you know, to reach my potential if you like it. And and when I look back uh, at it, it's uh, it's amazed me. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that I haven't talked to you about in terms of um, obviously all the things that I had to go through to get to where I am. Because when people say, "Oh, I played for Australia and I played professional," but to get to there, you know, there's so many things you had to come through. And, uh, and and it's a good thing because if it was easy, then everybody does it. And and all those hard things uh, made me, um, like you said, more open-minded person who want to contribute to the world. And I feel like, you know, you know, I have a calling, and that's you know, and and a wambo and 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 giving back and seeing kids. Um, play soccer and have that joy is I feel like that is what I want to do um and 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 yes all the experiences that I had um definitely helped make my my decision uh in terms of why I started an an unfor-profit organization for example rather than a profit organization where it's an academy and, and we charge kids you know, a lot of dollars uh, to to participate. So, because of I have those uh, challenges when I was younger, and I understand how hard it was for families and and for myself. Um, you know, for me, a non for profit organization was uh, the right one. So, yeah, I am I am absolutely glad. The you know the through the all the challenges I went through um, because you can only grow. Uh, when you challenge when everything is easy you don't learn anything so yeah it's been it's it's been a great experience and I'm, now i'm still getting challenged as as a founder and uh, uh, as a director of wambo because that's something that i've never done before and and i'm learning as, as i go thank you kamal and i'm just i just want to sort of make the observation really that i've seen you in 
action with those kids and those young people. And, you know, we talk a lot about in, um, in coaching training and in kind of mentor coaching about, you know, coaching can be quick, it can be to the point, it should be in partnership. And I see the conversations that you have with some of those young people and the mutual respect and the set and the space that it creates for you to have those really encouraging kind of positive conversations with those young people where they get to explore just a little bit of their world with you in a way that's helpful and useful and purposeful for them so yeah I I just want to say it's been lovely to see you in action and um, it excites me to see something that I'm passionate about coaching and helping people kind of come to their own insights and conclusions about life it's exciting for me to see um, glimpses of that in the work that you do with the young people at Womble so um, yeah it's Thank you for letting me have a little window into it. Um, just before we finish, come on. If there's, um, if there's, if if people want to kind of delve a little bit deeper into this I- idea of, um, well, you've been talking about a lot of things really: adaptability, positive mindset, values, and purpose. Are there, are there some areas, some things that have really helped you that you might recommend to others? Um, what would I recommend? Uh, I, I think, I think, uh, you know, for, for me, um, it was, it was patient and, and not, not taking it personal, mm-hmm. um, got me really, uh, in a place where I didn't lose my tempo. Yeah. You know, the, like I said, <laughs> Uh, there's been times in my own teammates um, have caused trouble for me um, because, you know, uh, it's always been the only African player in the team or even when I was playing for Australia and they didn't like that. So, you know, they caused the trouble for me to, to fight them to do this. And, and I used not to fight them, but show them on the field. Yep. Do you know what I mean? So, so I would go and play. If, if they're being racist to me or they're fighting me or something like that, I would be so upset inside. But my mentality was, okay, so you don't think I'm good enough. You don't think I belong here. So I'm going to show you on the field exactly that. And I will go and play one of my best games. Um, and, and, and then afterwards, they will come to me and try to be my friends or to apologize to me. So for me... I had to adapt. I had to adapt um, rather than fighting or rather than uh, talking. I, I wanted to show by actions, mm. right? Because that is the best way. You know, you cannot talk your way out of things. You know, you show by actions and, and that was enough. You know, what else can, you, can they do? You can't do anything. If, you, if they're telling you you're not good enough, or, or you, 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 this, you don't belong here, and you go and score two goals or, or become uh, best on ground, they really can't say anything because you're showing it by action, you know? So for me, I would say, you know, just to, 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 to be patient and to, to, um, to show by example, you know, by your actions, that's, that's, what, what, that's one thing I would say. Mm. I I love this observation and you're almost kind of bringing us full circle to where we started which is um you know the the challenge I'm taking away from this conversation Kamal is um you know I I feel really committed to issues around equity and diversity and I'm just going ah oh, are my actions showing it <laughs> and so mm-hmm. you know I, I think that's a really useful a useful kind of note to finish on so that we can yeah that listeners can perhaps think about yeah what's what's the thing I'm passionate about and are my actions demonstrating it and what might I need to do to bridge that gap yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, like uh, like uh, like I said, you know, adapting adapting to something it, it, it's hard, you know, 
it's hard, uh, especially if, if there's something that um, you haven't, it's completely different, for example, from Africa to Australia, that's big, massive. You know, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna take a while. So people need to understand that you have to give these people uh, the, the, the time for them to adapt to things, you know? Yeah. Um, and in coaching, I read a statement today, uh, sorry to go out of topic, but Asan Benga, the coach said, you know, it's better um, kids from five to 12 years old to have no coaches rather than have a bad coach. Right? Interesting. Yeah, because the kids, you know, this is why it's important the role we play as when we're coaching young kids, they are still very young. They're still open-minded. Anything you do, anything you say, uh, will stick, right? And you you can mold them to 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 have a, a different mentality. So you, when you have a bad coach, then it's you know they he's gonna he's gonna influence them in a bad way. So it's and and I agree with that what he said. Um, so it's better them to to just have fun and 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 be. Um, uh, open-minded uh, rather than being um, you know told uh, something that you know doesn't benefit them so yeah at one ball it's very it's very um, important that you know obviously our coaches have have um, uh, our good role model to, to the kids yeah that feels like a perfect place to land Kamal and um, if listeners are interested in finding out more about Kamal's work um, we'll put the various links to Womble the social media links etc etc in the show notes Um, I'm sure um, Kamal would be open to to some feedback and to hearing from folks who might be interested in his work as well Um, so I just want to say thank you so much Kamal for sharing um, sharing a little glimpse really into your story because there's clearly a lot more to a lot more that could be unpacked here but thank you for the challenge that you've laid down and for your openness and um yeah and sharing sharing with us this morning so thank you so much for your time and um we look forward to seeing you in the next episode where we um pick up another another leadership trait and take another deep dive into it with another guest in the arena um Thank you for listening and hopefully we'll be talking together soon. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Kirsty. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you and thank you for having me. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, we'd love you to share the podcast with a friend or leave a comment on social media. And if you'd like to become a regular at The Coaching Inn, you can subscribe on Podbean and all major podcast channels. We look forward to welcoming you next time. You've been listening to The Coaching In, 3D Coaching's virtual pub. For more information, check out 3dcoaching.com.